We're live. Um, hello, friends. My name is Ranjit Anipal, co-founder of Be Waste Wise, your knowledge partner for the resource revolution. Welcome to Pioneers and Changemakers. This uh, new initiative is a weekly series of 30-minute interviews with some of the best minds in circular economy, sanitation, wastes, and resource management. There are, um, as you might have known, um, there are a lot of problems in our world, but not enough leaders. So in this program, in addition to learning what people are doing worldwide, you'll also learn how they implement solutions, how they solve problems and choose between alternatives and why they began their journeys. Um, and that's just so that you could connect with them, I guess. And um, this program builds on our annual program, the Global Dialogue on Waste and our knowledge partnerships with the Asian Development Bank, the International Solid Waste Association and Waste Aid UK. These interviews are not just about listening to leaders, but it is about learning to be a leader and becoming one. So it is for the pioneers and change makers in you. And um, if you have any questions, uh, use the live chat box below the video and send them to us. Uh, and if you learned anything from this interview, please share it with your colleagues and friends so that they can also get the opportunity to learn. If you'd like to support us and keep us going, you can use the donate button on the website or go to wastewise.be slash donate and make a one-time or monthly contribution. With that, let's welcome my friend and uh, a world-renowned sanitation and waste management expert, Sanjay Gupta. Sanjay, welcome to Be Wastewise again. Thank you, Ranjit. Um, great. Um, so when Sanjay um, approached um, us initially about this interview, he wanted to do a hard-hitting interview and we then met online and uh, to brainstorm the discussion points and none of the points had any masala in them they were all uh, positive constructive solutions to the problem uh, develop problems developing countries face so th this is something that we often lack you know there's always on tv on yeah. media there's always the you know a lot of uh, polarized polarization that happens but uh, which is why we have this series where we actually talk about real solutions real constructive solutions to problems um, around the world. So Sanjay is the best interviewee we could have hoped for. So Sanjay, uh, could you tell us a little bit about um, your work? Um, what are you doing right now? Um, how do you, where do you get your livelihood from? Uh, okay, thank you everybody for participating in this. Uh, my name is Dr. Sanjay K. Gupta and I have been working in this space of garbage for last 17 years. Uh, both in the countries in transition and developing countries and a little bit in developed countries. Uh, I work with a company called Scott Consulting based in Switzerland in St. Gallen. And most of my works revolve around uh, waste management and sanitation with a primary focus on waste management in developing countries, particularly working with the urban local bodies, which we popularly call municipalities. So my experience of last 17 years basically deals with what kind of municipalities we have and are they good enough to provide adequate waste management services. So I deal with the institutional capacity, institutional reform, and also a lot of training to, to take them one step ahead from where they are currently. So, so not looking at uh, radical changes, but incremental changes, which can be institutionalized and can be taken up with the next level of next generations without uh, without much problems. Right, and um, what Sanjay mentioned, uh, incremental solutions is something extremely important. We started this um, series with Robert Egger from LA Kitchen, who mentioned that there is a concept called uh, relentless incrementalism where you know leaders and people around the world should slowly chip away at problems as opposed to you know mass changes which do happen but they happen rapid changes which happen but they often happen very rarely and the relentless incrementalism is kind of you know what kind of drives change around the world sanjay um you recently moved from switzerland to india um why and what are you doing right now well, uh, some of the projects that I'm doing uh, with SCART across the globe, I think I can do with uh, in India also. And then there was uh, this passion to do something in my home country, particularly in my hometown in Tinsukia. 
is one of the dirtiest town. I'm both ashamed to say that and also proud to say that in the sense that I moved just to bring some change in my municipality. So, so I, I moved primarily for helping two of the municipalities, Tinsuka and Dibrugar, to improve its waste management system, where there is a lot, there are innumerable problems that they are facing, but at the same time, they don't have the capacity to deal with them. So, so on the invitation of the chief minister who took, uh, he said, come over and we'll help you out. So I, I'm trying to kind of judge whether this, there is a political will to make some changes or are, are these just mere talks on the social media, on, on, on the different platforms where Swachhata mission or cleanliness mission has been really, really ballooned to an extent where everybody thinks that lot is happening, but what when I see at the grassroots, nothing seems to be working, particularly for the smaller municipalities. There are a few good examples. Definitely, they have taken good steps, but it is basically my volunteerism, my passion to bring the change that brought me from Switzerland to India now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and uh, this is something that I've heard from many other people working in the sector. You know, they do hear a lot um, of uh, media buzz, but they still feel like nothing's actually happening on the ground. But when I speak to others, you know, who are not in the sector, they feel like it's a lot more um, happening now than before. So I think, um, do you have any comments on that? Uh, I mean, some people in the big cities, uh, to, I'll give you examples later on, but just to say Mashur, Indore, uh, Coimbatore, uh, Pune, there are a lot of things happening. So depending where, which kind of people you are interacting with, they will say positive things and there are positive things, it's not to say, but in the smaller municipalities, there are fewer and fewer such examples. Okay, okay, great. And um, so we've, we've been talking about decision making quite a lot and uh, it's extremely important in, in countries, in, in all countries and especially in uh, developing countries. And, uh, you know, there are different problems like corruption and capacity building. Could you talk about the corruption? How, how does it actually impact decision making in your, in your experience? Okay, uh, let, let me uh, take it from the political wheel point of view and how, how a political wheel can both change corruption angle as well as the implementation of the uh, good solid waste management system. Uh, the good examples that you will see uh, in India are happening precisely because there is a good mayor or there is a good commissioner who is taking the lead to make things happen. So there is a will in terms of the support of the mayors in support of the elected council that I want to get things done. And this is when the commissioner is, is emboldened by the fact that he has some support of the elected councils of the mayor and he's taking bold decisions. Uh, let me give you an example, both Pune, Coimbatore and Masuru and Indore. In, if one common thread in all the four good case studies, Alapu, another in Kerala, is that it is the lead taken by the mayors. And this political will has translated into a very good action where things have improved in the last two to three years. Drastically, I, I must say. I, I'm not sure to what extent this has been institutionalized, but as long as these mayors are there and the political will that has been displayed, the things have worked out. And then you also see where things are working out, the level of corruption either gets stagnated or reduces. Places where these political wills are lacking, there the corruption is increased, particularly in the procurement. At this point of time, when the, with the Swachhata mission, particularly in India and many other places, I can give you an example of, there is no dark of resources as such, financial resources. But still, things are not happening. The only thing that has been interesting to the municipalities is procurement either procurement of vehicles, procurement of equipment, procurement of uh, treatment and processing plants, where there's a huge commission. These commissions could be as high as 50% or, or at least somewhere between 10 to 30% is the generic uh, level of corruption that happens. Besides that, there are other corruption in labor and fleet management, all that. So the political will either stagnates the corruption or reduces it. But a lack of that actually increases corruption. Right. Um, and um, you had some examples uh, on, you know, the cases of corruption um, in India. Um, could you talk about them? 
Well, uh, I was recently investigating uh, to make a uh, detailed project report for the city, couple of cities. I was investigating how much they are spending. And I was quite astonished to see that one of the municipalities, they bought uh, community bins at somewhere around 16,800 rupees. A pair of two bins with, with a system to hold it. And this was so bad that it can't hold the amount of waste for which it is meant to be. And secondly, the number of bins that they had procured, they didn't have enough place. For example, the order was for 5,000 bins. And in a city of that size, which is just 120,000 of population, you, you, you won't require more than 120 pieces. Mm. And they're procuring 5,000 because of the huge corruption that was in there. So it was exact, it, it was that. Then another place I found that another municipality was going to procure uh, 12 tonner and 16 tonner compactors. These, these people don't have, I mean, they haven't even seen their road width. These compactors can't even fly on those roads. And, they, and in the entire state, except for one city like Guwahati, they don't have any other place where they can repair it. And the accessories are not level, uh, available in those cities. So they're buying all these things, whether it is a compact whether it's a bean or whether it is a, a compost plant not because that they really need it but just because the 30 percent commission that they would probably get through the procurement i've seen in empty places now in the last last six seven years where they have procured things which is just getting rotten including vehicles they're not flying mm -hmm. but particularly in assam i saw it in tinsuki i saw it in gimbrugar i saw it in tispur in other places in maharashtra i saw a brand new compost plant installed not used i in, in andaman and nicobar i saw a plan with 30 million inr which was bought for uh, uh, inorganic waste management which did not work and the people who bought it they exactly knew that it will not work but in spite of that because of that factor they went in and bought it mm. so yeah is it um, only corruption? Is it also a lack of capacity in these cases? I mean, not knowing that um, these solutions would or would not work or whether not knowing whether which solution fits that specific um, um, uh, situation or maybe it's just the pace of change that these guys are unable to um, catch up to it because of a lack of, lack, lack of capacity. So what do you think it is or is it a combination of these two? Well, uh, for the smaller city, I would definitely say it's a lack of capacity. They don't mm -hmm. know what to buy, what to procure, what is the right equipment. But for the bigger cities who have who have also done the similar things, it is not the lack of capacity. In a city like Delhi, where they are buying things which is not required, and as like Bangalore, they do know what is required. They exactly know what to require. But if those things are not giving them enough cut then they're not interested so they're buying anything everything that can give you give them more money in terms of corruption mm. but a smaller cities do lack this lack this capacity because they don't have the data they don't have the technical knowledge on what to what is needed but i still believe there is a common basic sense with people who have been doing waste management for 20 years and not understand what kind of bean to be bought so I will not buy this argument that they exactly don't know mm -hmm. that what to buy, but they do know something which is even ignored, mm -hmm. ignored, ignored at their own for their convenience for different things. Right. And um, how, what kind of data is available out there, you know, for um, Indian cities uh, to be able to take better decision making? Well, uh, let me be very frank with you. A smaller cities which are less than half a million population in india a smaller by the indian context and not uh, other cities uh, other countries they, they don't have any credible data most of the detailed project reports are made by cut and paste they don't do any survey they don't have a way bridge they don't weigh it at all they don't analyze the waste composition characterization nothing in tinsuka for the first time we did a survey of weighing the waste and taking out the uh, uh, composition and characterization. It's a similar study in the neighboring uh, in neighboring municipalities. We have consultants who come for one day and make a detailed project report on solid waste management. Mm. It's just a cut and waste. So the data quality is extremely bad for the uh, smaller cities. Um, um, and how, the so um, uh, data quality is low for 
uh, almost all cities um, in India. I think my report in 2012 was probably tried to bridge that gap a little bit. But again, it's uh, when I published in 2012, I was getting data from 2005 or 2000. Um, eight or 2009. So it was really old data by the time even I published. So, um, but more recently, let's say, let's give Rajkot, Sura, Pune, they, they have weird reasons. They exactly know how, how much is coming and how much is going out, how much is being processed. But then those are more exceptions than the rules. Most of the cities, they don't. Okay. But there are some credible data for the bigger cities. Right. And so uh, how are you dealing with these problems? How are you solving these problems in Tinsukia? Okay. Uh, coming back to Tinsukia, it's a small town, uh, 120,000 population. What we are trying to do is to collect very credible data from residential areas, from institutional areas, from commercial areas, and see what what is existing and what is not existing. So once we know what kind of, for example, just to give you a very small example, what I found out that if I do put two dedicated vehicles for the hotel, I can get out 60% of the organic commercial organic waste. So these kind of the data don't exist. This is which is we are trying to create. Similarly, with the schools, we saw that if we just put a very basic kind of system, we can reduce the entire organic waste from the educational institutes, and we just implemented two of the zero waste uh, schools in uh, Tinshika College and uh, Vivekan and Vidyalaya. And, and those, 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 those might look very small, small initiatives, but if you multiply it, what they are every day doing compost into 365 days, you'll see that at least three days of the city's total waste generation gets composted within the campus. So they don't have this vision that I'm doing 10 kg of composting, but over the 365 days, it is 3,650 kgs. They don't have that kind of reason. The, the immediate reaction is, ah, that's too small. It doesn't make a difference. It does. So this is these are the kind of things we are trying to take initiatives and then telling them, this is what you have done. This is what the uh, emissions we have reduced. This is how much recycling we have been contributed to in terms of paper or plastic or pet bottles or glass. So when people see, when the students see, they do realize that they are contributing something. So what we are trying to do is to take small pieces of data turn them into a smaller decision, implement it, and show them that what they have achieved. How are you able to do it? I mean, I know um, it's really difficult to, uh, at least, um, yeah, it, it's really difficult to do something new anywhere in the world, um, especially in India. So uh, how are you able to achieve this? What kind of support are you getting? How did this start? Uh, I mean, since I was invited by the chief minister, the, the member of parliament, which we call MP, and the member for legislative MLA, they are very supportive. So as I said, if there is a political will, there, the things get done much faster. So a call from the MLA, a call from the MP, or a call from the minister is making this facilitation very easy for me, as of now. And I don't know how long this will last. For example, after the DPR we made, the, the government has already sanctioned 200 million INR for implementing the project based on the estimates that we have made. So as of now, it has been a political will that is driving the change. How it will turn out in future, I'm not, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I think the connection with the political uh, politicians has been working here. Mm -hmm. And um, so how was the study that you did funded? How was it funded? What was the structure of it? Uh, the study has been funded by the, a very active deputy commissioner uh, who, who is here. And he, he did realize, uh, he's a learned man. He did realize that without data, good decisions can't be made. And he funded the entire uh, detailed project report. I contributed voluntarily coming back, uh, traveling thrice from Switzerland. But rest of the thick cost has been completely taken care of by the deputy commissioner's office. Okay. And this is the first year for a municipality which is 100 years old. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, that's wonderful. And um, how did you, you, you were talking about political will, but how did you get that? I mean, we understand that, that it's, that's important, but how did you get that political will? How, what were your channels um, to getting that? Uh, okay, it has been a bit of a family network and a bit of a, a friends who knew me. 
So my, my brother happened to know the MLA and the MLA spoke with the chief minister and he said there is such and such guy from our own a small town who is like doing a service in Switzerland, why not to call him and do something. So this kind of the networks with the friends and the family that walk through the politicians to bring me back here. But I also must appreciate that the chief minister was proactive in listening and giving me a call and asking, okay, come over, we'll help you do something. Uh, whatever you say, we'll carry out, we trust you completely. I think this, this kind of the network so far that has helped me get to the next level. So we, we have the complete plan now. Now we are just waiting uh, for the next stage of tendering out the uh, collection and processing systems and get uh, get it implemented in the town. Right. So um, you started something that wouldn't have been possible without you. Like, you know, uh, you started, uh, you know, the study um, on your own. And if someone, uh, if one of our listeners want to do something like this, what are some of the tips that you have for them based on, you know, your experience doing this in India? Well, one thing I, I must clearly say, make an intelligent guess that how much support is there and how much of that support is really genuine when you are going out and making uh, an estimate doing a study. A study is fine uh, as long as you want to publish academic papers. But if you really want to make an intervention out of that study based on the data you have collected, then you must gauge the level of political will and the level of collective action that is present in that city. As of now, I have found a decent level of uh, support. And it could also be because the city is going through the worst phase of waste management. There have been strikes, there have been crises at the dump sites, there have, there have been fights due to solid waste management between the municipal workers and, and general public. So you have to make an intelligent guess whether the situation is right to, for making an intervention or not. So talk to the mayor or the chairperson, whatever you call the elected head, talk to the commissioners who, who is the administrative head and make an intelligent guess. You must ask whether they have decent financial capabilities to go out and make initiatives. Unless there is a political will that I will support you or we will support you, I, I don't think any, anybody should take a, uh, take a risk on that. Because this is something that can't be done with our donor money or a small project money. Those are fine for awareness, but if you want to make a substantial intervention, then you must know that what is existing and what can be done. Right. And uh, you mentioned institutionalizing change earlier in when you were talking, and that's extremely important in, you know, to actually make change long term and sustainable. So here is a question from uh, Nikhil Bugalia from Tokyo. He's asking, um, he's saying, first of all, great work, Sanjay. And then he's also asking, do you also plan to improve governance structures within the departments in, in these towns? Uh, yes, um, I, I don't think these kind of changes will um, last long if you don't have done the reform correctly at the institutional level. So uh, I've already proposed to the state government a new institutional system for, for Assam. So that clearly defines the role of the person who will be in charge of solid waste management and the people beyond, uh, below and how they have to be trained. I think the current system, at least in Assam, and which is true for other, other municipalities in the country, is that there has been no institutional reform in the last 70 years. And those municipalities which on their own, for example, Surat was the first one that took the institutional reform. They, they have more or less still stayed clean since 1998. So it has been 20 years that those decentralized and carried out by a very, very active uh, Commissioner S.R. Rao, he got a Padma Sri. He made those decentralizations and clearly defined the responsibilities and accountability, has stayed that long. I'm trying to do something similar in Assam. So we just appointed one person who will have all the data of solid waste management and he will monitor. And then the idea at the next level is to prepare a team of supervisors who know everything about law and their accountabilities are clearly de described. Mind you that in India, you will seldom find a job description of a waste worker or a sanitation supervisor. This is something we're trying to do because we also realize that it's not entirely their fault that they don't know their job description. They are asked to do anything and everything. So we're trying to clearly define what their jobs are in, in terms of in the chain of the solid waste management. 
So we have taken one step and we are going to take the next step somewhere in May. All right, wonderful, great. Sanjay, um, um, I have a question because when I was in traveling in Africa, I found that except for the big cities, all the small cities, uh, in all the small cities, the plastic, even the high value plastic is not being collected. Even if it's collected, it's just dumped somewhere. And um, you told me that it's the same situation even in Assam. Um, so could you talk about that? I mean, there is so much talk about circular economy in Europe, but then the actual problem with plastics, you know, kind of starts in these small towns and cities where there is absolutely no chains, uh, no uh, value chains for even high value plastics. Could you talk about that a little bit and probably also suggest some solutions to this? Sure. See, for the smaller cities, particularly in the regions like the mountain regions of India, let's say Himachal and Uttarakhand, Jammu and Kashmir, and also in Assam, forget about the low value plastic. Even uh, high value plastics of HDP, LDP, PP, PET bottles, they don't have enough market and people don't collect it. So, so even if you get a good segregation done and if the person doesn't get a right price, there, is, there will always be reluctance. And with very high fluctuating prices of the plastics, the, the recycling thing may not work as you wish to do. So, so it's, it's not that, that the, in the circular economy, everything will fit everywhere. One has to be very innovative in finding a solution. What here we are trying to do, bless you. What here we are trying to do is that, that take the plastics of all kinds and we are encouraging, there are two, oil refineries here, uh, Indian Oil Corporation and Numali Gold Refinery Limited. What we are asking them under their CSR contribution, let's buy this plastic at a premium, which they can easily do, and they have agreed to. And let's make plastic to fuel, go back to, um, make it fuel and then they have the refinery, they can refine it there and come back into the uh, system. That, that looks more valuable than doing the traditional recycling. I don't think in the smaller cities, traditional recycling will work. At least in Assam, Himachal, and Uttarakhand, I get, I get these queries every day. What should I do? I have collected this much plastic. If you transport something from, imagine, uh, from Rampur in Himachal to Delhi, and the value is already lost, the cost of transportation will be so huge. And locally, even if you recycle them, there is no market. And the cost of that recycling is much higher than the cost and the value of the plastic. So, so it won't work. So one has to find other ways of making something out of it, which can be locally used. For, for example, I would, I would still say that uh, plastic to fuel for Assam is the way to go. Right. Um, so uh, we have a comment, um, rather large comment, uh, long comment, and a question from Rajesh. He's from Pune. He's asking, uh, first of all, congrats, Sanjay. And you also have a keep up the good work from Swapnil. Um, so Rajesh's question uh, comment is uh, uh, great that you've got sanctioned 200 million for implementation. It is true that political will help will help in implementation, uh, but in spite of calls from politicians, it is really difficult to work with lower level officials. Um, so uh, it, especially if they're not educated on these issues. Um, and if they are educated, then the collective political will will also increase. So he's asking, should uh, we be more focused at every level to solve the problems on a you know larger scale um, instead of just maybe political will um, aspect? So could you quickly respond to this? We have only one minute. Okay, I must say a very good question. One of the things that we have been constantly saying that train the lower level of the people, the top level. You Train the top level, they, they just get transferred everywhere. So they don't stay. But if you train the lower level, and I completely agree with Rajesh, they will stay with the system. They will know the rules, they will know how to implement it, and they will know their responsibilities and accountabilities. I do agree with him that we need to work at all level, but this will flow from the political way. Once you are able to convince the, your, the politicians that I need, to tra I need to train the ground staff, the sanitation ground staff, or you know, what is called conservancy staff, or the sweepers, or the waste collectors, is much more impactful, much more fruitful than training the commissioner and then training the engineers. They, they do know. And if you train them, it doesn't percolate down to them. So 
I do agree that we need to work at all level, particularly at the ground level for training them. Okay, great. Uh, Sanjay, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I think this was a great interview. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope viewers, um, you learned a lot from Sanjay. And um, next week, uh, we are interviewing Cole, Ro Cole Rosengren. Um, he, is, uh, he works with Waste Dive and he's uh, probably one of the very few journalists uh, who covers waste management industry specifically. And uh, he's been doing a lot of work on uh, plastics, um, you know, the China ban and also everything that's related to waste management industry in the U.S. So um, join us next week uh, to hear from Cole Rosengren. And um, two, uh, two weeks after that, we have uh, Sarah Curry Halpern. Um, she's, um, the, she runs a, a consulting company called Think Zero LLC. And she's also uh, chairs uh, the Manhattan Solid Waste Ad um, Advisory Board. So she's doing a lot of uh, for-profit and non-profit work. Um, and there's a lot that she has to say, share on how she gets all of these things going. So uh, thank you very much for joining us again. And if you learned from this interview, please share it with your friends and colleagues so that they get an opportunity to learn too. And if you'd like to support us and keep us going, uh, use the donate button on the screen or go to wastewise.be slash donate to um, support us. Uh, with that, thank you very much. Sanjay, thanks again. Thank you, Reggie. Thank you for view. Thank you viewers who are listening to this conversation. Thank you so much.